Last Sunday was the solemnity of the Pentecost. And so I thought this would be a perfect opportunity for us to reflect a bit on the Holy Spirit, which of course is the third divine person of the Holy Trinity. But for many, the Holy Spirit himself remains a mystery within the mystery of the Holy Trinity. It may even seem somewhat odd to refer, refer to the Holy Spirit as him, and yet he too is a divine person, co-equal in every respect with the Father and the Son. Let's begin our reflection by considering this question. What is it that gives life to the human body? Is it not the spirit that animates the body? Is not the spirit the life force within the body? Yes, for when the spirit leaves, the body dies. And just as the human body has life as long as the spirit remains, so too with the mystical body of Christ. So too does Christ's church have life because the Holy Spirit dwells within her. It is the Holy Spirit that animates the church, giving her life, making her a living organism, growing and maturing. It is through the power of that same Holy Spirit that we are nourished and sustained by the Holy Eucharist and the other sacraments that we may be ever more faithful, ever more sensitive to the Spirit's promptings. Now our Lord himself said just before the ascension that it was better that he should go back to the Father so that he could send us the Holy Spirit. And yet that's another mystery. For if Jesus were standing right here in our midst as he stood with the apostles over 2,000 years ago and said, it is better for you that I go, Surely this would have been incomprehensible to us. How can it be better that you go, Lord? Would it not be best of all if you stayed with us always? And yet, what did the apostles do as our Lord ascended to heaven? St. Luke tells us that they knelt and worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, blessing God constantly in the temple. Even though they had not yet received the Holy Spirit in the manner Jesus had foretold, even though Jesus' presence would not be the same as it was before, nevertheless, they rejoiced that Jesus loved them so much that he would send them the paraclete. Such was their faith in he who had made the promise. We see this in the Blessed Virgin Mary as well, whose very body was overshadowed, whose body was animated, if you will, by the Holy Spirit, and who, because she was open to the Spirit, received in her womb the Son of God. In doing this, Mary not only became the mother of God, but also in a mystical and very real way, she became the mother of the church, for she bore Christ, the head of the church. And even more than that, the glorious incarnation, the glorious enfleshment of deity in Mary's womb foreshadowed and anticipated what would happen to the church at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit gave life and enfleshed, if you will, the members of the mystical body of Christ. Abbot Vonier, who wrote extensively on the Holy Spirit and Pentecost in his 1933 book, Christianos, the Christian Life, said the unique presence of the Holy Spirit in the church is as new and as significant as the unique presence of the Son of God in the Incarnation. 
The incarnation was an entirely new way for God to be with man. The Pentecost was an entirely new way for the Holy Spirit to dwell within the mystical body of Christ, that is, his church. But in what way is the Holy Spirit within us? Perhaps Helen Keller's life can give us a clue. Most of us have heard of Helen Keller. She was born in 1890 and went deaf and blind at 19 months of age due to an illness. When she was six years old, her parents hired a teacher for her named Ann Sullivan. This was the beginning of a close and lifelong friendship between them. By means of what's called a manual alphabet, Anne would spell into Helen's hands words like doll or puppy. Within two years, Helen was reading and writing in Braille fluently. But since she still couldn't hear, at 10 years of age, Helen couldn't speak. But Helen finally did learn to speak by placing her fingers on Anne's throat to feel the vibrations and then imitate them as closely as she could using her own voice. She did this, but even so, her speech was difficult to understand, but Anne translated for her. Helen went on to graduate with honors from Radcliffe University. After nearly 50 years of companionship between Anne and Helen, Helen wrote these endearing words about her lifelong friend. She wrote, My teacher is so near to me that I scarcely think of myself apart from her. Her being is inseparable from my own. The footsteps of my life are in hers. All the best of me belongs to her. There's not a talent or an inspiration or a joy in me that has not been awakened by her loving touch. What Anne Sullivan was for Helen Keller, the Holy Spirit is for us. All that is good in us, all the best in us, is awakened by his loving touch. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, too. Though we do not know how to pray, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, the Scripture tells us. When we're open and docile to the Spirit, we can feel his vibrations, if you will, just as Helen felt the vibrations of Anne's voice. And when we do this, the Holy Spirit can animate our lives and fill us with his life and his love.